Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so threshold cryptography dates back to the late 80s already and there was a lot of work done in the 90s. And the idea was that you would have a number of parties sharing a private key for decryption or for signing. And you would need some authorized subset in order to carry out any of the operation, any signing operation or any decryption operation. And there are many applications for threshold cryptography. Uh, you can think of multi-signatory applications. So you want to have uh, some two out of five uh, people in the company signing on a check or, or, or something to that effect. More recently, there's been a lot of interest in this due to uh, its application to key protection. So you want to keep your secret key uh, safe. You can either put it in dedicated hardware, but that can be pro problematic in many situations. So you can split it and put the different key shares on different machines, protect them with uh, different operating systems in different environments, different administrators, and make it hard for an attacker to get to, to all parts of the key and therefore keep it safe. And this is actually now being uh, deployed in practice and the number of startups doing this. So we know already from a couple of decades ago that RSA and El Gamal, uh, ECIS, which is again just Diffie Hellman, Schnorr signatures, all of these can be done very, very efficiently. Even if you have malicious adversaries who uh, will run any arbitrary attack strategy to try and break the protocol, uh, can be, we, we can protect against that using very efficient zero knowledge proofs inside these protocols. And, and, we, and this, this is really a solved problem. We can do this very, very efficiently. In contrast, uh, DSA and ECDSA are, are very expensive. By the way, I'm going to talk about ECDSA, but it's exactly the same for DSA because everything here is just generic in the group. Uh, in particular, the best two-party protocol takes numerous seconds for a single signature. And that's a very significant overhead. And it also has an extremely expensive key generation protocol. So it's problematic to actually deploy such a solution. The question is why? Why is ECDSA so much harder than all of these other, uh, all of these other uh, protocols or these other uh, en encryption and, and, and signing schemes? The reason is that it has this uh, strange or, or unusual feature that you have to generate this random value k and, uh, and it's inverse and these have to be secret and not, not known to both parties and it's actually non-trivial in multi-party computation to generate shares of, of, of a random value and its inverse. And that makes it actually very, very difficult. So just to elaborate a little bit on that, let's compare Schnorr signing to ECDSA signing or what would happen when we try to naturally make a two-party protocol uh, uh, for these, for these uh, signing schemes. So in both of these uh, signing uh, uh, schemes, you choose a random k from zq where q is the order of the group. And you compute uh, an elliptic curve point R, which is k times g, where g is the base or generator point of the curve. In Schnorr, you then hash the message together with that point. And in ECDSA, you do something different. You take the x portion of the point, which anyway has the, the bulk of the entropy, and you reduce it mod q, and you get a small r. And now you have something completely different. For Schnorr, you have a linear equation, which is just k minus x times e. And in ECDSA, you take the inverse of k and you multiply it by the hash of the message plus r times x. You do all that mod q, and you output r and s. In Schnorr, you output e and s. So you can see that Schnorr the whole way through is just very linear, except for the hash function. Whereas ECDSA has this k inverse, which, which makes things problematic. So let's do a two-party Schnorr signing. So we have the secret key x. And the natural thing to do is to have each party hold an additive share of x. So p1 will hold x1 p2 hold x2, and, and the sum of the, 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 these is the, actually the secret key. And of course, they're random under that constraint. You need to choose a random k. Well, that's also pretty easy. p1 will choose k1, p2 will choose k2, and, uh, uh, and they can even define a local r1 and r2 value by multiplying that by the, point, by the base point, and then they can compute r by simply summing those together. Okay, so this is very, very easy to do in, uh, very efficiently. Once they know r, they can each locally compute e, because it's a hash of the message in r. And then they need to compute this final equation, this s equation. So each one can again locally do this. So p1 will compute s1 to equal k1 minus x1 times e, p2 likewise. And you just sum those together and you get the signature. So it's all linear, all very nice. You have to add some very basic zero knowledge proofs here, but it, it's very, very efficient and, and everything works very nicely. If you try to do this in ECDSA, 
everything sort of messes up at this at the stage of trying to compute s because of the k inverse if you have additive shares of k it's very hard to compute additive shares of k inverse and you sort of have this choice either we have additive shares and then getting shares of k inverse is hard or maybe we'll try multiplicative shares but then combining the, the different values to get s is going to also be very hard and, and so everything so, sort of breaks down now in the, the mid-90s there was work on this for the multi-party setting uh, with an honest majority done by Langford and then done by uh, uh, Gennaro, Yarecki, Kravchik and, and, uh, and Rabin but I'm, I'm going to focus on the two-party setting and with, in, in that case obviously there's no honest majority. So let's just quickly rewrite ECDSA and, and what I want you to notice is just that there's this S part has two separate sub-equations, the left-hand red side and the right-hand purple side and we're going to have to deal with these separately which is why I've colored them differently and I'm going to put that up in the top right-hand corner so you can follow uh, the, 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 see, see the, um, the, the basic signing scheme the whole way through. So Mackenzie Ryder were the first uh, 16 years ago here at Crypto were the first to actually uh, provide a protocol for the two-party case and their approach was, was as follows. Firstly they said Additively sharing is going to be difficult, so let's multiplicatively share the, the values. So parties, the parties hold x1 and x2, which are random under the constraint that the product of x1 and x2 equals x. That's not a problem. And since we have to make this consistent throughout, instead of additively sharing k, they'll multiplicatively, multi, multiplicatively share k as well. So p1 will choose k1, p2, k2, and, and k will be k1 times k2 and then r of course will be k times g and this is actually just Diffie-Hellman key exchange you can see that p1 will send k1 times g, p2 will send k2 times g and they can each locally compute k1 times k2 times g so this is actually very easy to do once they have this value r uh, uh, that, that lets them go to the next step and also since the, k, the sharing of k is multiplicative they can each locally compute an inverse of their portion of k and now they have shares also of k inverse. So we've solved the problem of k inverse and everything is okay uh, and each can also compute this uh, r which is rx mod q. So what becomes now difficult, what's difficult is computing s because we don't have additive shares and this is uh, um, uh, an ad or, or linear, linear equation or at least of k inverse. But what they do has, have is they have R and they have shares of both K and X and, and, and now uh, what uh, Mackenzie Ryder say is let's use Payer which is additively homomorphic in order to finish this computation. So P1 generates a Payer key pair and can then encrypt each part of this equation separately uh, using its own values. So P1 will encrypt K1 inverse times the hash of the message which is his portion of the left hand side and uh, will also encrypt k1 inverse times x1 times r which is again his own portion of the right hand side of the purple side and will send that to p2. Now p2 can use the additively homomorphic properties of Payer to finish the signature. How, how can uh, he do that? Mul it can multiply the left hand side by its own portion of k2 inverse and multiply the right hand side by its portion of k2 inverse times x2 and what you now get is you get two, two encryptions one is of k inverse times the hash of the, hash of the message and the second, second ciphertext is an encryption of k inverse times x times r and all you now need to do is just add them together luckily it's additively homomorphic encryption so you can add them together p2 can uh, then send that back to p1 who will decrypt and get the signature so everything is fine. Uh, just small caveat, you have to actually have to add noise because inside Payer encryption you're working over uh, a large ring, you're not working mod Q, so you add noise in order to, to distort any difference here. So this seems very good, what's the problem? The problem is that in the case of malicious adversaries when you want to force the parties to actually behave honestly and do the correct thing, it becomes really really hard to prove that you're behaving honestly. In particular for one, just one example P1 needs to prove that the encryptions that it sends contain K1 inverse. Now, it's true that, K, that P2 has some function of K1, which is R1, which is K1 times G, but it doesn't have anything which is a function of K1 inverse. It's very, very hard. It's very unclear how you can even prove such a relation in an efficient way. 
And actually, if you look at the McKenzie Rider paper, there's zero knowledge proofs go span about a page and a half of equations of, of, of computations and exponentiations that have to be proven. And there's an auxiliary Payer public key, and there's a whole lot of other things, and it's really, really, really expensive to do. There's been a number of follow up works to McKenzie Rider. They've all reduced the cost of these zero knowledge proofs, but they're still very, very expensive. And there's still a very big bottleneck because proving that you're behaving correctly here is very, very difficult. So what can we do? Our approach is, we, is to try and remove all of these expensive zero-knowledge proofs. We still have some zero-knowledge proofs, so very cheap, discrete log, like proving that you know the discrete log of something, which is just actually a local Schnorr signature, so that's really, really efficient. And the way that we do this is we still keep to the McKenzie Rider paradigm, so they have, the parties have multiplicative shares of x, but we also assume that P2 has an encryption of x1 under party p1's payer public key. So, and we can take care of this during setup. So it's assumed now, now that p2 has an encryption of x1 and knows that it's a valid encryption of x1. Of course, it doesn't know what's inside because the key belongs, the private key belongs to, to p1. We can do this in the setup and we'll see now this actually makes everything really, really easy. And, and that's actually the, the main observation of, that, that, uh, of this entire paper. So the first step, and you can see the bottom right in yellow, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show what, what uh, I'm talking about there, which part of the signing operation we're talking about. And as in McKenzie Rider, the parties will run a Diffie-Hellman key exchange to generate this uh, value R. I call it a simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It has some zero knowledge proofs inside for a discrete log. It has some commitments, but it's basically just a key exchange to compute multiplicative shares of K and to get R, which is K1 times K2 times times g. And then again, both parties can locally compute r to be rx mod q, uh, because they both know now the, 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 the elliptive, elliptive curve point r. And, at, and this is very efficient and very simple. What's interesting now is look at what p2 has. p2 has the curve point r, has its shares of, of the secret key so you, and, and k, so at x2 and k2. Obviously, it also has K2 inverse because it's, it's its own share. And it also has an encryption of X1. And if you look closely here, what you see is that actually P2 can now work completely by itself to compute what I call an almost signature. An almost signature is a signature, but instead of having K inverse there, it has K2 inverse. But everything else is a full signature. And it can do this all by itself without interacting at all with P1. How? P2 can encrypt K2 inverse times H of M, because these are values that it knows. It can also encrypt uh, uh, K2 inverse times R times X2 times X1. Why can it do times X1? Because it has the encryption of X1 to start with. So again, this is scalar multiplication inside additively homomorphic encryption. If you look at what this is, this is actually a uh, the only difference between this and a full signature is that you have to multiply it by K1 inverse. That's the only difference between them. And in fact, not only is that the only difference, this is, that means that given a real signature, you can actually even generate this value yourself. P1 could generate this value itself by multiplying, by, by multiplying it by K1. So this value reveals nothing to P1. So P2 can compute this value by itself, which is an almost signature, inside the encryption and just send this ciphertext to P1. And P1, uh, as in McKenzie Rider, you add some noise, but we're ignoring that for now. And P1 has the curve point R, K1, X1, and this ciphertext, of, which is an encryption of the almost signature, just decrypts, multiplies the almost signature by K1 inverse, and it's finished. It now has, uh, uh, has completed the signature, and there's almost no interaction, and mainly local work done by the parties. What then party P1 does is just verify this is a valid signature and we're completely finished. So it's no longer pages of uh, complex zero knowledge proofs and actually in practice it's not just efficiency, it's also, it's also simplicity of the protocol which is important if you actually want to deploy this. And, and this is a diagram of all you have, a simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchange followed by P2 doing local work, sending a ciphertext to P1, P1 decrypts, and, and you're done, and, and multiplies by K1 inverse, and you're done. The question is, why is this secure, and how has this suddenly magically solved all the problems of cheating? So in order to understand that, let's look at the security, let's argue security for this protocol. What happens if P1 is malicious? So P1 is malicious, wants to cheat, 
The only thing that P1 does is participate in this simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And you can't cheat in this. All you get to do is send your part of the key exchange and you have to prove that you know the discrete log, but that's, again, very easy. You can't cheat. There's nothing that P1 can do. P1 just gets a ciphertext from P2 and decrypts and multiplies it by something and outputs it. It can multiply it by the wrong value. It just means it itself will get an invalid signature. It won't make any difference whatsoever. So P1, a malicious P1 can't do anything, and we've saved all of the zero-knowledge proofs that P1 had to send to P2 because there's nothing that P1 is doing here at all. What about P2? And that's the interesting question. The, the observation here is that we're not computing a general secure computation function. We're computing a digital signature. And what that means is that when P... So, so what's the danger? The danger is that P2 can send an invalid message to P1 because P2 is malicious. So instead of doing this correct homomorphic operations, P2 could send something, some arbitrary garbage or something which is incorrect and, and, and P1, how can P1 know? The answer is very simply, P1 can know because it's a digital signature scheme. So when P1 gets the value, decrypts and multiplies it by K1 inverse, P1 can just check that the signature is correct. And that means that if P2 tries to cheat, it's not going to help because if it's an incorrect value, P1 will know it's an incorrect value simply by verifying that the signature is correct. And you don't need any zero-knowledge pro zero proofs anymore because correctness is validated just by verifying the signature. And that makes it all very simple and very, very efficient. Uh, there is one thing that you might, and might be bothering you, and if it's not, it will bother you now once I say it. Maybe P2 can generate a ciphertext that just knowing whether this ciphertext actually is a valid, results in a valid signature or not, will, will reveal information about the secret key. First, you should, know, you should notice that it can only reveal a single bit, because that's the only information that there is. And this is indeed a problem. So we get around this in two ways, and, and, you can, and this is all in the paper. One is by using a game-based definition, and in game-based definition, you can just simply guess the first point at which the adversary gives you a bad signature, and, then, and, and, and everything goes through. And we can also prove it under a full simulation-based definition using a very strange, uh, uh, weird assumption. So that's in the paper as well. And if you're into weird assumptions, which seems to be very popular these days anyway, then, then you could take that and, 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 and be happier. But actually, the game-based definition, I think, is, is very, very convincing. No zero-knowledge proofs. Just using the fact that it's a signature scheme and you can verify and everything is OK. What about key generation? So the key generation phase, like generating the uh, multiplicative shares of K, does a simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and that's easy. We send X1 times G, X2 times G, and you can each locally compute the public key, which is X1 times X2 times G. That's very, very cheap. But remember, we needed to have P1 send an encryption of X1 to P2 under its own public key, and, and, and P2 has to be sure this is correct. Now, this is a very crucial point. If P2 if P1 sends an incorrect value, then when P2 sends back the ciphertext to P1, it may reveal information about P2's secret key to a malicious P1. So we have to be very, very careful about that. So we construct a very specific zero-knowledge proof to prove this, this statement. So this is actually not a difficult statement to prove because there are no inverses or anything. You have P, P2 actually has X1 times G because that's sent in, in, as part of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And you want to prove that that's actually the value that's inside the Payer encryption. So it's an interesting zero-knowledge proof because it bridges between two completely different worlds. You're given an elliptic curve point x1 times g, and you need to prove that x1 is inside this Payer encryption. Uh, but it turns out to be not, not so difficult to do, not, not, not so expensive to do. It, but that's the most involved part of the entire protocol. That's only done at key generation. So what's the performance of our protocol? We implemented and ran it on uh, Azure uh, with standard, uh, just very standard instances on single core. And this is actually inside a product. So it's like a full, with, with a full environment and the, the parties communicate over TLS. And there are no shortcuts here. And key generation takes between 4.8 and, and 7.8 seconds. I'll explain this jump in a second. That's done only once. So that's actually very reasonable. And and signing actually takes only tens of milliseconds. So you can actually sign a few hundred uh, ECDC uh, uh, signatures a second using just a single core. Obviously, if you want higher throughput, 
then you can simply increase the number of cores. Latency is what you have here. Uh, this is actually 80 to 100 times faster than the previous best protocol. So that makes a very, very big difference. And in terms of key generation, it's actually thousands of times faster because the previous best protocol needed distributed RSA key generation uh, as part of the protocol, and that's very, very, very expensive for, in key generation. Now, why does it jump? Why does suddenly the, uh, the cost jump when you go from, from the 384-bit curve to the 521-bit curve? The reason is that you actually need, because of this noise that I mentioned you added, you need the Payer key to be at least four times the size of the uh, group order. Now, we're always taking 20, 48-bit Payer anyway. The modulus is always going to be that size because that's the minimum size for security. So for P256 and P384, it's, it's a 20, 48-bit key. But at 521 times 4, you have to make it a little bit bigger. But because Payer is the real bottleneck in this entire thing, even just making it a little bit bigger, 80 bits bigger, actually causes this very big jump in, in, uh, in running time, especially for, uh, for key generation. Uh, and, and a lot of work is actually, we did a lot of work to, tr to, to reduce the amount of noise you needed to add. In previous protocols, you had to make it eight times or nine times larger, and that would, of course, kill everything and, and, and slow it down by a lot. So in conclusion, we have a new secure ECDSA protocol for two parties. It's much simpler than previous protocols because it doesn't have any of these very complex zero-knowledge proofs or distributed RSA key generation and so on and so forth. It has efficient key generation and signing. It can run on servers. It also, it's also runs between a mobile and a server very efficiently without any problem. And it's fast enough for many applications. You could think of Bitcoin signing if you wanted, but key protection in general. Uh, and it's fast enough and, and, and works very well in all of those settings. Thank you very much.